Hi, welcome to City Cinema Tech, where the art and pleasure of the movies are the subject of serious discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach film studies at the City College of the City University of New York. Today, it's our pleasure, indeed our delight, to present the 1931 French musical, A Nous La Liberté, directed by René Clair. This is an important film for the development of the musical genre, for the development of the use of sound in cinema itself, and for the kind of spirit that it creates that really brings back a very lost epoch. We'll be able to talk about that and a whole set of other things after today's screening. It's a pleasure to have returning to City University Television the film critic of the Christian Science Monitor, David Sterrett. Now, enjoy this delightful occasion to see A Nous La Liberté. Welcome back to City Cinema Tech. So we return from the road of life to the table of criticism. Uh, there's a lot to talk about about this delightful film in the next 30 minutes, but let me take this moment to introduce today's guest. Uh, returning to City University Television is uh, David Sterrett. David is known, I think, to many of our viewers as a longtime critic of film for the Christian Science uh, Monitor, perhaps uh, less known as the fact that he teaches also at Long Island University and Columbia uh, University. He's the author of uh, several books, including a volume on the films of Hitchcock, another on the relationship of the Beats uh, to film, and is currently working on a book on Godard. Nice to have you back, David. Good to be here. Let's start with something that's very important uh, to this film. Uh, one word, sound. This is a film from 1931. This is late, one might say, in the transition to sound. It takes four or five years according to how you're counting. Sound for us today is something I think most uh, many spectators think of in two ways. One, a sort of natural feature of the film world. Uh, it's just there, people speak perfectly, uh, environments sound like what they're supposed to sound like, and indeed, uh, if there's a second feature to it, it's the technological expansion we've had in recent years. Digital, Dolby, stereo, so these sounds of accuracy or whatever are, are even more sharp, more crisp. You really are in a spaceship or, or whatever. But if we turn the clock back well over uh, 60, 60 years ago, we now, there was a whole set of debates about in this movement from silent film to sound film. Really, a, it was not a settled question about how was sound going to be related to image and used in this medium. Could you help us and sort of rehearse for us what some of the terms of that d debate were? Well, uh, sure, it's a really important moment, obviously, yeah. in film history. And um, sound caught on pretty quickly with the public, uh, in fact, very quickly, yeah. uh, once it was introduced in the late 20s. But among filmmakers, there really was an enormous amount of disagreement about whether this was a good idea or not, and a lot of very important, very influential, and very in-touch filmmakers, yeah. we're not talking about ivory tower pedagogues right. or something, uh, really thought this was a terrible idea. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock, for example, was uh, afraid that that the introduction of sound was going to turn film into what he called photographs of people talking. Right. In other words, there would be no need to tell your story cinematically uh, if you could just have people stand there and talk and talk and talk. And, of course, early sound technology um, almost forced the right. latter option into existence because uh, microphones were not particularly developed and they were always hidden in a flower pot and the performers would have to stand near the flower pot and talk at it and they couldn't walk and talk at the same time and the cameras made noise and they couldn't move around the way they used right. to and so for a while movies did turn into photographs of people talking. Right. Uh, there was also uh, a very strong theoretical debate about this. Uh, somebody like Eisenstein, for example, uh, who felt that sound was going to be a total disaster if it was redundant, if it right. was simply, in other words, if you saw a gun go off and you heard a gunshot, what's the point? <laughs> uh, but Eisenstein said, if sound were used contrapuntally, if it were used in such a way that it and the image were playing off each other and generating new possibilities every moment, new meanings, new layers of signification, then this would be great. Right. And René Clair actually took very much that view himself. He was one of the people who was very suspicious about what was sound was going to do to cinema. He was already an established silent filmmaker. But he had this idea of if the 
sound didn't simply repeat the image but did something different, then we might be onto something. It's, it's interesting for us to recover the simple fact that, of course, silent film, while it needed the translation of particular intertitle cards, was this creation and it was thought in this modernist utopian moment in a certain ways of being the ideal 20th century art form because it had created a universal visual language. Absolutely. And one of the reasons for the international nature of this debate over the theory and practice of sound was that everyone knew that no matter how popular it was, was the, with it was with the public, the coming of sound would be the, the Tower of Babel. Yes. Uh, and that this possibility of a truly universal communicative means was then going to be fragmented into, all, in, into a number of these things. And it is interesting that a number of the filmmakers that you have named in the 1920s had worked across national boundaries. While we associate an Eisenstein uh, with uh, the Soviet Union or Hitchcock with, uh, with Britain, in fact, Hitchcock had done work in Germany. Um, uh, eventually, Eisenstein, it is a little bit later, but eventually he would come to Hollywood for periods of time. So there was this sort of sense in which a, um, a whole project that everyone thought was going to move forward in a certain kind of way was potentially destroyed by this coming of sound. And of course there was a lot to that worry because uh, we did end up with uh, national cinemas right. with their own languages and we had to rely on dubbing or subtitles or, or, or whatever. And there are both pluses and minuses to, to, to this. It's an enormously complicated historical issue. What's interesting and I think relevant to our current discussion is the fact that different things were tried in the yes. very early sound era as a way of avoiding this Tower of Babel, of maintaining cinema as to some degree an international medium. Uh, Hitchcock, for example, in some cases would shoot different versions of a film, yes. and not only Hitchcock, uh, with different dialogue spoken in different languages. There are different uh, versions of his film uh, Murder, for example, uh, which have different stars and different scenes depending on what was appropriate for the British star or the German star, etc. And what Claire was interested in doing, and again, not only Claire, right. but was creating a kind of sound film that could have words and dialogue and so forth, but would still be pretty much comprehensible yes. wherever you went. And in his early sound films, not only A Nous la Liberté, but A Le Million, Sous les Trois de Paris, we have these movies which almost manage to speak to everybody, despite the fact that they're in French. So we right. have this wonderful international sound film, and in fact, the print that we've just seen of A Nous la Liberté, if you count the number of subtitles in it, there That's are very right. few, and yet we know what's going on every moment. You hardly need to know the exact words they're saying most of the and, time. And that's absolutely absolutely the case. And for a number of our viewers, for example, who know who know French, it's also interesting because the the things that aren't even translated in the subtitles in this print are it's not primitive French, but it's a very very simple French that anyone can un that, that can, uh, uh, can understand. And the burden is carried by the situation, by the bodily posture, by the uh, by the nature of the interaction uh, as seen in its framing, etc. And of course by the music. Oh it, we, yes, uh, this is going to be a a, a a big topic. Before we get to the music and sound in this film. Let's go back to Claire and silent film. That is, who, let's bring ourselves up to date with who Rene Claire is when he's making A Nous La Liberté. Sure. Uh, Claire um, was an actor and a few other things. In fact, he acted for uh, Louis Fouillard, uh, and the great maker of, of, right. of, of serials, uh, who was very respected and admired by the surrealists. Right. Um, and uh, Claire himself had a surrealistic Dada-esque kind of a streak. Uh, he began uh, filmmaking in 1924 uh, when he made a film called Paris Qui Dort, which actually means uh, Paris asleep or right. sleeping Paris, but is usually known uh, in English speaking countries as the crazy ray um, about a, uh, a scientist who invents a machine that freezes all of Paris right. in its tracks so that our main characters can walk around through this, uh, this situation. Oh, proto Twilight Zone. A lot of fun. Absolutely. <laughs> Where was Rod Serling? And um, also uh, made, of course, what is still, I think, one of his most beloved films, a short film called Entre Act, which was made for a, a really a Dada-esque performance. It was made for a ballet suédoise uh, production of a ballet called Relâche, which literally means uh, no performance tonight. Right, right. And um, it's, the, the movie itself is called Entre Act. It was meant to be shown during the intermission uh, and had music by Eric Satie and um, featured performers like Marcel Duchamp and, and Man Ray, a 
major figures among right. the surrealist yes. crowd. So this is really where 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 Ray was coming, where where, me, where, where uh, Claire was coming from. Right. Um, he had these links with the surrealists and the Dadaists and the, these rebels, these young Turks. But he also knew how to entertain people. Yes, these absolutely. movies of his had a lot of outreach and were very popular. And um, by the time we come into the early sound period, uh, he I think really was put on the map uh, by the movie we just looked at, Anu La right. Liberté, um, which was very much an extension of what he had done in silent film in terms of visual storytelling and visual character development and so forth, um, with at the same time using very creatively and right. cleverly this new medium of sound. Yeah. Uh, he's, uh, I, I want to point out that one of his silent films, which is available on cassette as a, as, as a feature film, uh, is The Italian yeah, Straw, Straw Hat, Hat uh, which is an adaptation of a famous uh, French, uh, French farce and um, is one of those, is a very interesting film. It's certainly, it's, it's a hilarious film. Okay, one can recommend it at that pure level of this is a great comedy, etc. But it is one of those films of the silent era that is a remarkable example of a stage vehicle that is transposed into a purely cinematic uh, vehicle. We don't have a sense of this having uh, had an origin on the stage itself. And uh, if viewers get interested in what you've uh, so accurately described in seeing this progress from silent film to sound film in someone like uh, René Clair, uh, Italian Straw Hat's a really very good place to begin, and you and one will be delighted uh, <laughs> while one is doing the study, as it were. Well, of course, you're absolutely right, and I should have mentioned that film earlier because it's uh, it's it's just one of the most popular and, and probably beloved films uh, out of, of fr France in the silent film era. Uh, you raise a very interesting point and a an totally accurate one that uh, we have uh, Claire's ability here to take a stage vehicle yeah. and make it into something that is truly cinematic. Right. What's kind of ironic ironic about this is that Claire himself always swore by the soundstage or the stage y yes, and later yes. the soundstage which is to say he was against location shooting for him and he didn't exactly I think especially his career move as his career moved along and was not consistently successful. Right. I don't think he saw this as some kind of a principle that films ought to be made on the stage rather than location. I think he saw this eventually as kind of a limitation of his own, right. but it was one that he really stuck to. He really wanted to be able to control, to manipulate, yes. to create works of art that were that were fabulous artifices. Yes, and that that, that will uh, sort of can eventually uh, link us back with the music because it seems to me as if uh, Claire has a kind of aesthetic which is, um, for lack of better phrase, compositional rather than naturalistic. Mm -hmm. And we can talk mm -hmm. about, we'll talk in a few minutes about how he portrays the world because it's not as if he's rejecting, uh, uh, commenting or portraying the world, sure. but his view of film form is very much a nearly musical one mm -hmm. in the sense that he has a certain, he views the elements of cinema as if, you could almost say, as if they were notes and he's mm -hmm. going to arrange them in that way, which is, the exact opposite of something like the later aesthetic of, say, the Italian neorealists or of a great American like John Cassavetes, who believes that the camera, the camera itself is capable of capturing things mm -hmm. in some in some way, and then you mm -hmm. sort of put it all together from there. No, 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 no. He, you can you can see in something like Anu la Liberté the disposition of certain of even modest little motifs, mm -hmm. and it's as if you know the the, the raising of the eyebrows between mm -hmm. the two mm -hmm. the, the two characters that recurs a number of times, mm -hmm. and you need the cinematic camera to capture that because mm -hmm. you need a certain kind of shot because if it's really if it's theatrical into the back back row, maybe it's not the kind of effect that's going to that's going to work. And it's almost as if, you know, it were a little motif of the piccolo that mm -hmm. just comes in mm -hmm. occasionally, uh, you know, sort of underneath the brass or, or 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 something like that. But it's always it's always there. And he that I think justifies this notion of the artificial, that he's really arranging everything and is really quite open about that. I mean this mm -hmm. is not this is not these are not works that claim to a realist aesthetic of uh, of drawing us into an illusion that we ever know is anything else but an, illu uh, uh, an illusion. Well, absolutely, I completely agree. And uh, it's interesting that as much uh, a, a, 
of, of, a, of a divertissement as this film is, as much as an entertainment. Uh, it's a very enjoyable film. It certainly has serious things on yeah, its yeah. mind, but it doesn't make great demands on us in order to comprehend it and appreciate no. it. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a piece of cake. Yeah. Um, but with, with, we still have the roots of, of, of Claire, I think, in, um, in, in, in real art movements, including yeah, yes. surrealism and, and, and Dadaism. Uh, it's a mischievous film. It's a film that plays little tricks on us. And it's a movie that doesn't worry about adhering to any kind of so-called objective reality yes. out there. Um, sometimes those little mo motifs that you, you refer to are, are literally musical as well as cinematic. Yes. Sometimes the, the performers will suddenly sing a phrase or two during the dialogue. Uh, the, look at the, the very beginning of the film, let's remember, that the, the, the music is, is not awfully fast and the men you know, right. sitting there in the prison doing their work are not especially happy and the camera is doing this long yes. tracking shot down and then back and then down. The music and the image are, are echoing each other, and both of them are expressing the mood of the yes. moment. So again, it has nothing to do with some kind of newsreel-like depiction of the world out there. It's very much a kind of a, of, of a beautiful construction that is, is musical, both for the ear and for the eye. Yeah, absolutely. You bring up a, uh, a wonderful uh, um, example, starting with that, that first scene. Many people who comment upon this uh, film uh, and make the film sound trite in a certain kind of way because they say, well, you know, it begins in a prison and it ends in a factory and uh, Claire, you know, equates, uh, equates the two. First of all, I think equates is the, is, is, is the wrong word. Compares is mm -hmm. perhaps mm -hmm. a, a different word. I agree. Uh, it, 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 and the other thing is that this is not done in this film by... Um, a kind of preachiness. It is not done by characters saying, oh, my comrades, this or uh, th th this or that. But in fact, part of the delightful formal play of the film is that Claire wants to include us in these set of observations. And he has a whole set of strategies uh, for, for doing that, uh, one of which is uh, comparative camera movements mm -hmm. themselves, mm -hmm. another of which is comparative framings of certain kinds of spaces, mm -hmm. another one uh, is, is uh, comparative spaces themselves, mm -hmm. more on that mm -hmm. uh, w as we wanted to chat, mm -hmm. uh, and then also uh, things like uh, details within the mise-en-scene, such as the um, uh, costumes people are wearing, the uniform-like things. But on the other hand, you know, having said that, it is a comparison and contrast between the two by all of these cinematic means. And it's, it's a lot of fun to observe this. I mean, it, and it's, it's a playful game of, oh, is this as bad as, or it seems as bad as now, but gee, there's this pretty girl here, mm -hmm. and she sure didn't seem to be in prison. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, all of that, uh, all of that kind of thing. Um, yeah, please go on. Well, it's a um, I, I, the movie sets up, I think, a very interesting kind of a little um, a little discussion about the nature of the modern world, which yes. is very much on all kinds of people's right. minds uh, right. when this movie was being made. And of course, something that we really must talk about at some point is the tremendous influence this movie had on Chaplin. Uh, yes. Chaplin, uh, already established, of course, as one of the world's great entertainers and one of the world's great artists, and and known everywhere on the planet uh, just under his first name alone. Um, and and Claire had learned an enormous amount from Chaplin and acknowledged that very openly. And at the same time, he was acknowledging Chaplin a lot. And something that they shared was um, an interest in, in social commentary. Yes. So there definitely is a, a, a level of, of real, genuine social criticism going on here. Uh, Claire uh, said once that he got the original idea for Anu La Liberté when he saw some sort of little flowers growing out of some cracks in the sidewalk in front of some kind of smoking factory building. Right. And he thought, oh, you know, life springs up spontaneously, you know, even in this awful right. concretized mess we're making of the modern world, and certainly it had only started back then. <laughs> we really know about that nowadays. <laughs> but um, he, he really, he wanted to, to discuss this in his movie, and he wanted to deal with this, and of course, we have the whole first part with the, the, the prison and all the miseries there, and then we have uh, the rise to, to power of, of, of the, the magnate with his factory, but then we come back to our other characters lying out there in the grass, and he just wants to kind of lie around oh, and yes. smell the flowers and live 
his good life and so forth. And this becomes the counterpoint, which is not a very complex one, that we follow yeah. through the rest of the movie. Uh, and it's playful, and Claire has a lot of fun with it, and we're allowed to have a lot of fun with it. It all comes up to a conclusion, which I think is pretty hard to take very seriously yes, on any yeah, kinds yeah. of real political grounds. But I think he really was interested in exploring these issues and in getting people thinking about them at the same yeah, time that they were having a good time. Yeah, no, no, and I think it, it, the, the film is fairly upfront about the fact that that it's about exploring conditions and uh, anything that it's going to propose. For example, the, the the final image of the two friends on the road itself is a conditional proposition. Mm -hmm. It's uh, and and it's 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 one of those propositions that that draws so much attention to itself. Is this motivated by by the genre. Uh, we all know that we want a happy ending. Or, or let me make this analogy, like the, the famous uh, example of Breck's um, The Three Penny Opera, mm -hmm. in which a uh, happy ending is put on by consensus mm -hmm. because the characters speak about the fact that you can't have mm -hmm. a uh, an unhappy ending. Mm -hmm. And so you, you get the happy ending, but it's it's a negotiated uh, happy ha happy ending. Now, let's talk Specifically, there, there's two aspects of this film and modern times. One is that there are more than just coincidences of subject matter uh, here. Um, I don't know, I mean, for, for my money, <laughs> there are two very conspicuous scenes that seem to be transformations of one another. One is the, so the scene on the assembly so, line mm -hmm. itself, which is, is perhaps the most frequently excerpted mm -hmm. scene from um, uh, Chaplin's Modern Times. And then the second one is actually the ending itself, the, the mm -hmm. notion of ending with mm -hmm. two people on a road. That's exactly. also how. Uh, Claire, some people were quite upset by this, I mean, uh, uh, by this similarity. Oh, uh, the, the, the production company for uh, La, right. La Liberté actually launched a lawsuit uh, against Chaplin, which Claire then squelched yeah. and said, you know, we all, I believe the words were, we all flow from Chaplin or something like yes. that, and I'm not going to sue him. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. no, exactly. So it, it, that sort of brings us back to the way in which, uh, even if there are certain scenes, whether it's simultaneous genius or the transformation of something borrowed, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. we, we'll, we, we'll never know. Mm -hmm. uh, in essence. But uh, that does bring us back to how this film represents the modern uh, world. Not only what it represents, but, but how it, uh, it, it represents it. Uh, one of the things that, that holds up extremely well about this film so many years later is the contribution of the, of, uh, the visuals to the film. Uh, and particularly, I'm, I'm thinking at this moment, of the extraordinary set designs, because as you mm -hmm. brought up earlier, this is not him going to fine factories, but in fact these were incredibly elaborate studio sets that were built, and there was a, a young designer named uh, Lazar Mirson of Rus mm -hmm. Russian origin mm -hmm. uh, who built these sets and who is, uh, I mean, quite literally an architect of a whole vision mm -hmm. of, um, of modernity. Uh, and uh, this is one of those instances where we can see that a, a director and a set designer have worked so that a camera angle and the particular lines of a building and the way they will fit are perfectly matched for the kind of Absolutely. vision they wish, to, uh, th they, they wish to make. Yeah. Well, uh, we've been talking about this film and modern times, but I think that one way of positioning Anula Liberté is it's sort of midway between Metropolis and modern times. Yes. Uh, and in Metropolis, of course, we have this enormously oppressive version of the industrialized world through much of the film, where the workers are enslaved in underground cities, where they labor away at, at meaningless and incomprehensible machines, of which I see echoes, for example, in the time clocks uh, that the men punch into yes, on their way yes, into the yes, factory yes. In, in, in Anula Liberté. Even even though those time clocks with their little clocks, uh, their little round circles also echo the disc logos. Yes. So it all kind of, of, of comes together. But I think that we definitely have echoes of Metropolis and the idea of the factory, the assembly line, the modern way of production yes. as being very oppressive. And then on the other end, we have Chaplin's vision of the same thing. In a way, Claire's vision of this and his criticism of this is more specific and, and more focused than Chaplin's, I think, in that it's specifically a, um, a, a record yes. manufacturing yeah, yes, company. Yes. Uh, it's, uh, I think, widely agreed that the model for um, for the character who becomes the recording magnate in *A Little Liberté* was um, uh, Charles Pate, uh, the great uh, magnate of, uh, of of both film and recordings yes, in France, uh, and. Um, 
it's interesting that at this time, I think there's a growing anxiety over not just mass production itself, which is what right. Chaplin attacks in yes. modern times, but, or criticizes and interrogates, but the idea of art as a manufactured commodity, oh, as yes, a manufactured yes. product. It's not that this is a brand new thing, but there's increasing awareness no. of it, an increasing thought about it. And um, of course, uh, Walter Benjamin wrote uh, an essay which is still read very much about the, the, the age of art in the work of mechanical reproduction. Right. The work, the work of, of art in the age of mechanical reproduction, in which he, among many other points that he makes in that very complicated and dense essay, uh, is that the aura that yeah. art once had starts to disappear. And this has a lot to do, in his mind, with music. And of course, yes. here we have a really serious art composer like George Oric uh, doing uh, this score, which will now be punched out on all these copies of this movie and listened to under who knows what conditions all over the place. Um, and there's also maybe the first beginnings of worry about what the the political leaders of the world are going to do with yes. these new tools, these new devices. Uh, something that Benjamin and the other Frankfurt School writers became very, very anxious about as the 30s proceeded was the use that people like Hitler and Mussolini were making of the ability to communicate with huge masses yes, of people absolutely. through very persuasive means such as recorded sound and broadcast sound and movies. Right. Uh, and of course in the Soviet Union, movies were being used as a very, very aggressive tool of the state for educating, brainwashing right. uh, the public. And so I think some of this is maybe going on in Claire's mind too as he's making this movie is thinking about, and in fact for one thing that kind of chills me a little bit yeah. because it's, I think it's not an echo of what's going on, it's more of a prophecy of what's going to happen, is the words that the judge speaks. Remember that our yeah. hero is picked up from the flowery field and marched off to jail because he's not working. Yes. And the judge says everyone must work because work makes liberty. Yes. And I'm thinking of Arbeit macht frei, yes, the words yes, inscribed yes. over the door of the death camp just a short time later on. So I think what's going on here, uh, you know, Claire is tapping into something very serious in this lighthearted frivolous What do you movie. think, let, let, let me go to uh, actually a specific shot in your commentary about that, because I think it's, it, it really summarizes a lot of what you're saying. There's a shot at the end that begins, he is, um, it's before they meet on the road at the end. It's just preceding that, mm -hmm. and in which it's a long tracking shot of the manufactured goods that then crosses a wall to the workers. How do you, we've just got about a minute left, so what, how, how do you think that shot, it's a very important shot. It's a, it certainly is. Well, earlier when I said I didn't think it, most of us could probably take the ending of the film very seriously in a political sense, I wasn't referring just to that modern times ending of the right. two going down the road into the, you know, the happy future, uh, but very much to that shot as well, where it's come true, the factory will make all these magnificent modern products without human beings doing anything except looking on and they'll all be able to be out there fishing in the river. It's all guys fishing in the river and then there's this dance going on. But it's utopian, it's uh, preposterous, and yet at the same time I think that even today there's something that makes us think if only it okay. were turning out if like that. If only we had more time we could talk about more. If you uh, would like more information about City Cinematheque, please drop us a line. Drop it to City Cinematheque, City University Television, 25 West 43rd Street, Suite 1220, New York, New York, 10036. Let me give you that information again. City Cinematheque, City University Television, 25 West 43rd Street, Suite 1220, New York, New York, 10036. David, a pleasure having you back here Wonderful. for your commentary and enthusiasm. Look forward to having you again. Okay, great. And I hope you join us again for our repertoire of international and American classics from the extraordinary treasure trove of film history. Thanks for joining us today.